Bartolome Moya was a gangster with a heart of stone who ran a bloodthirsty crew of drug dealers and killers in the Bronx. He was kind of a trendsetter, you know, he created a new business model. That model prey on fellow drug dealers because they have money or drugs and they are less likely to call the cops. The way Bartolome Moya went after his rivals was ingenious, extremely effective, and terrifying. They were posing as DEA agents, radios, badges, talking to cop lingo, you know, Crown Victorious, typical what you would think would be police, you know. Unfortunately, you weren't being arrested. You found out later on you were being kidnapped. They kidnapped big-time drug dealers pulling for ransom. In a way, it was a, a sublime crime because the victims were in no position to go to the police. You can't have people out there posing as cops. It just doesn't fly. At the time, police had no idea how the game was being played. The police department put together a task force, uh, assembled a number of detectives to work on this. The task force was dubbed Hercules. The target was a shadowy figure who seemed bigger than life. Federal agents with the Hercules task force began rounding up Moya's gang one by one. Facing federal prison time, many of Moya's crew pled guilty and cooperated with prosecutors in hopes of leniency during sentencing. This allowed the Hercules task force to track the shadow kingpin to a quiet neighborhood just outside the city of brotherly love. He had just moved there, not to escape, but to find help. In August 1993, Moya was brought out of the shadows and put into custody. He looked nothing like a feared drug kingpin. The lead marshal that was uh, working with the case, he told me, he says, look like this guy's not gonna make it through the night. You know, he, he looked very, very ill, very sick. So uh, that was how we found him. The 35-year-old was recovering from a heart attack. He had been diagnosed with congestive heart failure. The first thing we hear is, the man is not fit to stand trial. He's not fit to even be in jail. He's going to die. His doctors gave him six months to live. Moya's lawyer urged the judge to drop the case. The judge's attitude is, the man is going to die. We are going to dismiss the case against him without prejudice. If it turns out we're wrong, you can re-indict him. And just like that, Moya's released. In October 1993, Moya was sent back to Philadelphia to spend his remaining days at home with his family. We were certain that Moya wasn't simply going to quietly die. Moya was a, a survivor, uh, and Moya was a strong man. Moya is referred by his physician to Temple University Medical Center. The hospital at Temple University did not know anything about Moya other than what he filled out in his paperwork. He fills out the questionnaire. He tells the doctors that he's in the travel business, tour guide business. He passes himself as a loving father of two boys and a girl. So, like anybody else, he goes before the committee. Moya basically indicated that he had no money. So as a result of that, and you know, through humanitarian efforts from Temple University, he was next in line. Less than four months later, in February 1994, a drug deal went bad in the Bronx. What a coincidence. An individual in this old stomping grounds gets shot and killed, and he's a perfect donor match for Mr. Moya. Here is an individual who has no heart when it comes to his fellow human beings. So Moya, in essence, scammed this transplant. And the other kicker to this thing, you and I paid for that heart transplant. It was Medicaid. The whole thing. That totals about $200,000. Less than a month after the operation, 
U.S. Marshals were sent back to Philadelphia. We basically staked out the, the hospital. I remember I was in the waiting room, and an individual walked in with, with a, a white face mask. I recognized that that was him, but he was a lot different. With the heart transplant, you know, he had much more spring in his step. He looked, you know, he was bouncing. He did not notice me until uh, we came up and uh, grabbed him, and then he, he realized it. And his eyes went down. He was disappointed. Obviously, he didn't think he was going to be uh, uh, rearrested. Moya was transferred by ambulance from Temple Hospital, 100 miles away, back to the U.S. District Courthouse in New York. The judge was not pleased with me. He felt that I had operated in a way that was a bit rash. The doctors are afraid that the heart might be rejected. He has to take medication for that. Medical experts testified it would be difficult for him to get the kind of treatment he needed, the anti-rejection treatment, if he was in jail. I remember the judge said uh, he's in very, a uh, very fragile condition, and that if he fleed, he fleed, uh, but he would die. And with that, Moyer was released again. Within weeks, the man authorities had chased in vain for years disappeared without a trace on the same day he was intended to meet with his lawyer. He opted to flee the jurisdiction of the United States and go back to his native country of the Dominican Republic to avoid going to jail. It was frustrating because he did have an ace up his sleeve because he knows and everybody knew that at that time the Dominicans do not extradite uh, their nationals. Labu and the U.S. Marshals began lobbying authorities in Santo Domingo for help in bringing a wanted man to justice. We supplied them with family, friends, locations down there, places that he frequents. We never leave any stone unturned, uh, as they say. At 1 o'clock in the morning, I get a call that they apprehended him. I think he was given a choice. You can stay in jail as long as you want here, but by the way, we don't have the medicine that you need. Or alternatively, you can voluntarily get on a plane and go to the United States. I arrived down here at the local police station. He was sitting on a bench, handcuffed, and he looked at me, and he just put his head down. He shook his head. That was his reoccurring nightmare. I was always there, you know. Once he came back, uh, he actually tried to cooperate um, to get a better deal. Uh, the information he had was old. I don't think he ever really told us the truth. In the end, the shadow kingpin, who ran a crew of killers and drug dealers posing as police officers, pled guilty. After all we went through and all the ins and outs, I was convinced at this time that he was not getting out, that this was the, the final chapter. He was charged with 13 homicides, but quite frankly, he probably committed uh, over 30. As far as I'm concerned, he should have been put to death. In September 1996, Moya escaped the death penalty and was sentenced to 25 years. While he escaped the death penalty, the end result was the same. Bartolome Moya died in prison March 26, 1999, less than three years into his sentence. To go through all that and to find out that uh, uh, he passed away anyway in jail, it seemed to be a waste. I mean, I know I said that I wanted to see that heart beating behind bars, but it would have been uh, a much more pleasant experience to know that uh, uh, that transplanted heart went into a really uh, deserving individual. It's very troubling when people start speaking in terms of whether or not somebody deserves an organ transplant. Even people in prison are entitled to organ transplants they are going to someday get out of prison and hopefully be rehabilitated, hopefully become contributing members of our society.